Introduction to the Saga of the Greenlanders. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. The Saga of the Greenlanders, Author Unknown. Translated by Arthur Middleton Reeves, 1856 to 1891. Introduction The Wineland History of the Flotty Book. The Flotty Book is the most extensive and most perfect of Icelandic manuscripts. It is in itself a comprehensive historical library of the era with which it deals and so considerable are its contents that they fill upwards of seventeen hundred large octavo pages of printed text on the title page of the manuscript we are informed that it belonged originally to john hawkinson for whom it was written by the priests john Tordson and magnus Torhalsen. we have no information concerning the date when the book was commenced by john Tordson, but the most important portion of the work appears to have been completed in the year 1387, although additions were made to the body of the work by one of the original scribes, and the annals appended to the books brought them down to the year 1394. Toward the close of the 15th century, the then owner of the book, whose name is unknown, inserted three quaternions of additional historical matter in the manuscript, to fill a hiatus in the historical sequence of the work not however in that part of the manuscript which treats of wineland it has been conjectured that the manuscript was written in the north of iceland but according to the editors of the printed text the facts are that the manuscript was owned in the west of iceland as far back as we possess any knowledge of it and there is no positive evidence where it was written we have indeed no further particulars concerning the manuscript before the seventeenth century when we find that it was in the possession of John Finson, who dwelt in Flotty in Bredefirth, as had his father and his father's father before him. That the book had been a family heirloom is evident from an entry made in the manuscript by the same John Finson. This book I, John Finson, own, the gift of my deceased father's father, John Bjarnson, etc. From John Finson the book descended to his nephew, John Torfossen, from whom that worthy bibliophile, Bishop Brynjolf of Skalholt, sought in vain to purchase it, as is related in an anecdote in the bishop's biography. Farmer John of Flotty, son of the Reverend Torfi Finson, owned a large and massive parchment book in ancient monacal writing, containing sagas of the kings of Norway and many others, and it is therefore commonly called Flotty Book this bishop brynjolf endeavoured to purchase first for money and then for five hundreds of land but he nevertheless failed to obtain it however when john bore him company as he was leaving the island he presented him the book and it is said that the bishop rewarded him liberally for it the flotty book was among a collection of vellum manuscripts entrusted to the care of tormod torphias in 1662 as a present from Bishop Brynjolf to King Frederick III of Denmark, and thus luckily escaped the fate of others of the bishop's literary treasures. In the Royal Library of Copenhagen it has ever since remained, where it is known as number 1005, Folio of the Old Royal Collection. Interpolated in the saga of Olaf Tryggvason in the Flotty Book are two minor historical narratives. The first of these, in the order in which they appear in the manuscript, is called A Short Story of Eric the Red, the second, A Short Story of the Greenlanders. Although these short histories are not connected in any way in the manuscript, being indeed separated by over fifty columns of extraneous historical matter, they form, if brought together, what may be called the Flotty Book version of history of the Wineland discovery a version which varies materially from the accounts of the discovery as they have been preserved elsewhere. Before considering these points of difference, it may be stated that as we have no certain knowledge where the Flotty Book was written, 
neither have we any definite information concerning the original material from which the transcripts of these two narratives were made the original manuscripts of these narratives would appear to have shared a common fate with the other original forms from which the scribes of the flotty book compiled their work all of this vast congeries of early manuscripts has entirely disappeared this is the conclusion reached by that eminent authority the late dr Vigfusen, whose profound knowledge of the written literature of the north was supplemented in the present instance by that close acquaintance which he had gained with the flotty book by reason of his having transcribed the entire manuscript for publication this total disappearance of all trace of the archetypes of the flotty book although it is by no means the only case of the kind in the history of icelandic paleography is especially to be deplored in connection with the wineland narrative since it leaves us without a clue which might aid us in arriving at a solution of certain enigmas which this narrative presents in the flotty book version of the discovery it is stated that bjarni herjolfsson during a voyage from iceland to greenland having been driven to the southward out of his course came upon unknown lands that following upon this and as the direct result of bjarni's reports of his discoveries leif ericsson was moved to go in search of the strange lands which bjarni had seen but not explored that he found these in due course first that land which bjarni had seen last and finally the southernmost land to which after its products he gave the name of wineland this account differs entirely from the history contained in the other manuscripts which deal with this subject all of which agree in ascribing the discovery to leif ericsson and unite in the statement that he found wineland accidentally during a voyage from norway to greenland which he had undertaken at the instance of king olaf tryggvason for the purpose of introducing christianity to his fellow countrymen in greenland not only is bjarni's discovery unknown to any other icelandic writing now existing but the man himself as well as his daring voyage have failed to find a chronicler elsewhere although his father was a most distinguished man the grandson of a settler and a kinsman of the first icelandic colonist the first portion of the flatey book version the short story of eric the red concludes with the words bjarni now went to his father gave up his voyaging and remained with his father during herjulf's lifetime and continued to dwell there after his father the second portion of this version of the wineland history the short story of the greenlanders begins with the words it is now next to this that bjarni herjulfsson came out from greenland on a visit to earl eric etc as has already been stated the two portions of the history of the wineland discovery as they appear in the flotty book are not in any way connected with each other the first narrative occupies its appropriate place in the account of the life of king olaf tryggvason as do the other narratives similar in character which are introduced into this as into the other sagas in the manuscript and there appears to be no reason why the second narrative a short story of the greenlanders should be regarded as having received treatment different in this respect from other interpolated narratives of the same class if therefore we interpret the opening words of this story of the greenlanders it is now next to this to mean that the incident which follows is related next in chronological order after that part of the saga which has immediately preceded it it becomes apparent that bjarni's visit must have taken place after the battle of svoldr in which king olaf tryggvason fell and earl eric was victorious this battle took place on the ninth of september in the year one thousand as it is not probable that bjarni would have undertaken his voyage to norway before the summer following the earliest date which could reasonably be assigned for bjarni's sojourn at the earl's court would appear to be the winter of the years one thousand one and one thousand two we are told in the same place that bjarni returned to greenland the following summer and that subsequent to his return leif purchased his ship and went in search of the land which bjarni had seen but had failed to explore in the year nine eighty five according to the chronology of the short story leif's voyage of exploration as described in the flotty book could therefore scarcely have taken place before the year one thousand two but 
according to the other historical data already cited leif discovered wineland during a voyage to greenland undertaken at the request and during the lifetime of king olaf tryggvason hence obviously not later than the year one thousand the floddy book refers to this voyage in the following words that same summer he king olaf tryggvason sent gizur and hjalti to iceland as has already been written at that time king olaf sent leif to greenland to preach christianity there the king sent with him a priest and certain other holy men to baptize the folk and teach them the true faith leif went to greenland that summer and took on board his vessel a ship's crew of men who were at the time in great peril upon a rock he arrived in greenland late in the summer and went home to his father eric at Brattahild. the people afterwards called him leif the lucky but his father eric said that leif's having rescued the crew and restored the men to life might be balanced against the fact that he had brought the impostor to greenland so he called the priest nevertheless through leif's advice and persuasion eric was baptized and all of the people of greenland it will be observed that in this record of leif's missionary voyage no allusion is made to the discovery of wineland as in the other accounts of the same voyage with which in other respects this passage agrees by this variation a conflict with biarni's claim to the priority of discovery previously promulgated in the short story of eric the red is avoided a portion of this passage may not however be so happily reconciled it is said that through leif's advice and persuasion eric the red was baptized while we find in the short story of the greenlanders the statement that eric the red died before christianity moreover we have in the short story of the greenlanders in addition to this direct conflict of statement an apparent repetition of the incident of the rescue of the shipwrecked mariners when we are told that leif effected a rescue of castaways on his return from a voyage of exploration to wineland and was therefore called leif the lucky if this be not a repetition of the same incident then we must conclude that leif upon two different voyages saved the lives of a crew of shipwrecked mariners for which he twice received the same title from the same people in the description of the rescue contained in the short story of the greenlanders we read that the leader of the castaways was one tory easterling whose wife gudrid torbjorn's daughter seems to have been among the rescued this tory is mentioned nowhere save in the floddy book his wife was so famous a personage in icelandic annals that it seems passing strange this spouse should have been so completely ignored by other icelandic chronicles which have not failed to record gudrid's marriage to thorstein ericsson and subsequently to thorfinn karlsefni indeed according to the biography of this most noble lady as written in the saga of eric the red there is no place for tory for gudrid is said to have come to greenland in much less romantic fashion namely as an unmarried woman in the same ship with and under the protection of her father torbjorn another chronological error occurs in that paragraph of the short story of eric the red wherein it is stated that after sixteen winters had lapsed from the time when eric the red went to colonize greenland leif eric's son sailed out from greenland to norway he arrived in drontheim in the autumn when king olaf tryggvason was come down from the north out of halugaland it has previously been stated in the same chronicle that eric set out to colonize greenland fifteen years before christianity was legally adopted in iceland that is to say in the year nine eighty five once it follows from the chronology that leif's voyage must have been undertaken in the year one thousand one but since olaf tryggvason was killed in the autumn of the year one thousand this is from the context manifestly impossible if we may suppose that the scribe of the floddy book by a careless verbal substitution wrote for at bigya went to colonize instead of for at leta went in search of the chronology of the narrative becomes reconcilable in the short story of the greenlanders inaccuracies of lesser import occur one of which at least appears to owe its origin to a clerical blunder in the narrative of freda's voyage we are told that she waited upon the brothers helgi and finbogi 
and persuaded them to join her in an expedition to Wineland. According to the text, however, she enters into an agreement governing the manning of their ships not with them, but with Karlsefni. Yet it is obvious from the context that Karlsefni did not participate in the enterprise, nor does it appear that he had any interest whatsoever in the undertaking. The substitution of Karlsefni's name for that of Helgi or Finbogi by a careless scribe may have given rise to this lack of sequence a blunder which has crept into the genealogical list at the conclusion of the history may perhaps owe its origin to a somewhat similar cause in this list it will be noted bishop torlock is called the grandson of halfred snorri's daughter in the words of the manuscript halfred was the name of the daughter of snorri karlsefni's son she was the mother of runolf the father of bishop torlock now runolf was indeed the father of bishop torlock but he was the husband and not the son of Halfred. If we may suppose the heedless insertion of the word mother in the place of wife, the palpable error as the text now stands would be removed. It has been conjectured that the Wineland history of the Flotty Book has been drawn from a more primitive source than the narrative of the discovery which has been preserved in the two manuscripts, Hauk's Book and AM 557. Two passages in the Flotty Book narrative lend a certain measure of plausibility to this conjecture. In the short story of Eric the Red, it is stated that Eric called his landfall in Greenland Mediokul. In the words of the history, this is now called Black Sark. In Hauk's book, this mountain is also called Black Sark. In AM 557, it is called White Sark. Neither of these manuscripts, however, recalls the earlier name. Again, in the list of the descendants of Snorri, Karlsefni's Wineland-born son, appended to the short story of the Greenlanders, Bishop Brand is so called without qualification, while in both texts of the saga of Eric the Red, he is referred to as Bishop Brand the Elder. The second Bishop Brand was ordained in 1263. This fact, while it would, without the other evidence which we possess, establish a date prior to which neither Hauk's book nor AM 557 could have been written, seems at the same time to afford negative evidence in support of the claim for the riper antiquity of the source from which the Flotty Book narrative was drawn. However this may be, the lapses already noted, together with the introduction of such incidents as that of the apparition of the big-eyed Gudrid to her namesake, Karlsefni's spouse. The narrative of Freyda's unpalliated treachery the account of Wineland grapes which produced intoxication and which apparently ripened at all seasons of the year, of honeydew grass and the like, all seem to point either to a deliberate or careless corruption of the primitive history. Nevertheless, despite the discrepancies existing between the account of the Wineland discovery, as it has been preserved in the Flotty Book and as it is given elsewhere, so striking a parallelism is apparent in these different versions of this history in the chief points of historical interest as to point conclusively to their common origin. The two disjoined accounts of the Flotty Book, which relate to the Wineland discovery, are brought together in the translation which follows. End of Introduction Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Part One of the Saga of the Greenlanders, Author Unknown, translated by Arthur Middleton Reeves, eighteen fifty six to eighteen ninety one. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part One A Brief History of Eric the Red. There was a man named Torvald, a son of Oswald, Ulf's son, Aixnatori's son. Torvald and Eric the Red, his son, left Jaderen in Norway on account of manslaughter and went to Iceland. At that time, Iceland was extensively colonized. They first lived at Drangar on Hornstrands, and there Torvald died. Eric then married Torhild, the daughter of Jorund and Torbjorg the ship-chested, who was then married to Torbjorn of the Haukadal family. Eric then removed from the north and made his home at Erikstadir, by Vattenshorn. 
Eric and Torhild's son was called Leif. After the killing of Eyjolf the Foul in Duelinghrafen, Eric was banished from Haukadal, and betook himself westward to Bredafirth, setting in Eiksni in Eriksstadir. He loaned his outer dais boards to Thorgest, and could not get these again when he demanded them. This gave rise to broils and battles between himself and Thorgest, as Eric's saga relates. Eric was backed in the dispute by Styr Torgrimson, Eyjolf of Svini, the sons of Brand of Alptafirth, and Thorbjorn v. Fjelsen, while the Torgesters were upheld by the sons of Tord the Yeller and Torger of Hitardal. Eric was declared an outlaw at Tornesthing. He thereupon equipped his ship for a voyage in Eriksvag, and when he was ready to sail, Styr and the others accompanied him out beyond the islands. Eric told them that it was his purpose to go in search of that country which Gunnbjorn, son of Ulf the Crow, had seen, when he was driven westward across the main, at the time when he discovered Gunnbjorn's skerries. He added that he would return to his friends if he should succeed in finding this country. Eric sailed out from Snefelsioko and found the land. He gave the name of Midiuko to his landfall, this is now called Blacksark. From thence, he proceeded southward along the coast in search of habitable land. He passed the first winter at Eriksi, near the middle of the eastern settlement. In the following spring, he went to Eriksfirth, where he selected a dwelling place. In the summer, he visited the western uninhabited country and assigned names to many of the localities. The second winter, he remained at Holmar by Hrafensgnipa, and the third summer he sailed northward to Snaefell and all the way into Hrafensfirth. Then he said he had reached the head of Eriksfirth. He then returned and passed the third winter in Eriksi at the mouth of Eriksfirth. The next summer he sailed to Iceland, landing in Bredafirth. He called the country which he had discovered Greenland, because, he said, people would be attracted thither if the country had a good name. Eric spent the winter in Iceland, and the following summer set out to colonize the country. He settled at Brattahild in Eriksfirth, and learned men say that in this same summer, in which Eric set out to settle Greenland, thirty-five ships sailed out of Bredafirth and Gorgarfirth. Fourteen of these arrived safely, some were driven back, and some were lost. This was fifteen years before Christianity was legally adopted in Iceland. During the same summer, Bishop Frederick and Torvald Kudransson went abroad from Iceland. Of those men who accompanied Eric to Greenland, the following took possession of land there. Heriulf, Heriulfsfirth, he dwelt at Heriulfsnes. Ketil, Ketilsfirth, Hrafen, Hrafensfirth, Solvi, Solvadal, Helgi Torbransson, Alptafirth, Torbjorn Gleamer, Siglufirth, Einar, Einarsfirth, Hafgrim Hafgrimsfirth, and Vatnarferfi, Arnlaugsfirth, while some went to the western settlement. Leif the Lucky Baptized After that sixteen winters had lapsed from the time when Eric the Red went to colonize Greenland, Leif, Eric's son, sailed out from Greenland to Norway. He arrived in drone time in the autumn, when King Olaf Tryggvason was come down from the north out of Halugaland. Leif put into Nidaros with his ship and set out at once to visit the king. King Olaf expounded the faith to him, as he did to other heathen men who came to visit him. It proved easy for the king to persuade Leif, and he was accordingly baptized together with all of his shipmates. Leif remained throughout the winter with the king, by whom he was well entertained. Bjarni Goes in Quest of Greenland Heriulf was a son of Bard Heriulfsson. He was a kinsman of Ingolf, the first colonist. Ingolf allotted land to Heriulf between Vag and Reykjanes, and he dwelt at first at Drepstok. Heriulf's wife's name was Torgard, and their son, whose name was Bjarni, was a most promising man. He formed an inclination for voyaging while he was still young, and he prospered both in property and public esteem. It was his custom to pass his winters alternately abroad and with his father. Bjarni soon became the owner of a trading ship, 
and during the last winter that he spent in Norway, his father Herjulf determined to accompany Eric on his voyage to Greenland, and made his preparation to give up his farm. Upon the ship with Herjulf was a Christian man from the Hebrides. He it was who composed the sea roller song. Herjulf settled at Herjulfsnes and was a most distinguished man. Eric the Red dwelt at Brattahild where he was held in the highest esteem, and all men paid him homage. These were Eric's children, Leif, Torvald, and Torstein, and a daughter whose name was Freydis. She was wedded to a man named Torvard, and they dwelt at Gardar, where the episcopal seat now is. She was a very haughty woman, while Torvard was a man of little force of character, and Freydis had been wedded to him chiefly because of his wealth. At that time the people of Greenland were heathen. Bjarni arrived with his ship at Eirar in Iceland in the summer of the same year, in the spring of which his father had sailed away. Bjarni was much surprised when he heard this news, and would not discharge his cargo. His shipmates inquired of him what he intended to do, and he replied that it was his purpose to keep to his custom and make his home for the winter with his father, and I will take the ship to Greenland if you will bear me company. They all replied that they would abide by his decision. Then said Bjarni, our voyage must be regarded as foolhardy, seeing that no one of us has ever been in the Greenland Sea. Nevertheless, they put out to sea when they were equipped for the voyage and sailed for three days until the land was hidden by the water, and there the fair wind died out and north winds arose and fogs, and they knew not whither they were drifting, and thus it lasted for many duger. Then they saw the sun again and were able to determine the quarters of the heavens. They hoisted sail and sailed that duger through before they saw land. They discussed among themselves what land it could be, and Bjarni said that he did not believe that it could be Greenland. They asked whether he wished to sail to this land or not. It is my counsel, said he, to sail close to the land. They did so, and soon saw that the land was level and covered with woods, and that there were small hillocks upon it. They left the land on their larboard, and let the sheet turn toward the land. They sailed for two duger before they saw another land. They asked whether Bjarni thought this was Greenland yet. He replied that he did not think this any more like Greenland than the former, because in Greenland there are said to be many great ice mountains. They soon approached this land, and saw that it was a flat and wooded country. The fair wind failed them then, and the crew took counsel together and concluded that it would be wise to land there, but Bjarni would not consent to this. They alleged that they were in need of both wood and water. You have no lack of either of these, says Bjarni, a course forsooth which won him blame among his shipmates. He bade them hoist sail, which they did, and turning the prow from the land, they sailed out upon the high seas with southwesterly gales for three duger, when they saw the third land. This land was high and mountainous, with ice mountains upon it. They asked Bjarni then whether he would land there, and he replied that he was not disposed to do so, because this land does not appear to me to offer any attractions. Nor did they lower their sail, but held their course off the land and saw that it was an island. They left this land astern and held out to sea with the same fair wind. The wind waxed amain, and Bjarni directed them to reef and not to sail at a speed unbefitting their ship and rigging. They sailed now for four duger when they saw the fourth land. Again they asked Bjarni whether he thought this could be Greenland or not. Bjarni answers, This is likest Greenland, according to that which has been reported to me concerning it, and here we will steer to the land. They directed their course thither, and landed in the evening below a cape upon which there was a boat, and there upon this cape dwelt Herjulf, Bjarni's father, whence the cape took its name, and was afterwards called Herjulfness. Bjarni now went to his father, gave up his voyaging, and remained with his father, while Herjulf lived, and continued to live there after his father. Here begins the brief history of the Greenlanders. Next to this is now to be told how Bjarni Herjulfsson came up from Greenland on a visit to Earl Eric, by whom he was well received. 
Bjarni gave an account of his travels upon the occasion when he saw the lands, and the people thought that he had been lacking in enterprise, since he had no report to give concerning these countries, and the fact brought him reproach. Bjarni was appointed one of the earl's men, and went out to Greenland the following summer. There was now much talk about voyages of discovery. Leif, the son of Eric the Red of Brattahild, visited Bjarni Heriolfsson and bought a ship of him and collected a crew, until they formed altogether a company of thirty-five men. Leif invited his father Eric to become the leader of the expedition. But Eric declined, saying that he was then stricken in years, and adding that he was less able to endure the exposure of sea life than he had been. Leif replied that he would nevertheless be the one who would be most apt to bring good luck, and Eric yielded to Leif's solicitations and rode from home when they were ready to sail. When he was but a short distance from the ship, the horse which Eric was riding stumbled, and he was thrown from his back and wounded his foot, whereupon he exclaimed, It is not designed for me to discover more lands than the one in which we are now living, nor can we now continue longer together. Eric returned home to Brattahild, and Leif pursued his way to the ship with his companions, thirty-five men. One of the company was a German named Tyrker. They put the ship in order, and when they were ready they sailed out to sea, and found first that land which Bjarni and his shipmates found last. They sailed up to the land and cast anchor, and launched a boat and went ashore, and saw no grass there. Great ice mountains lay inland back from the sea, and it was as a table-land of flat rock all the way from the sea to the ice mountains, and the country seemed to them to be entirely devoid of good qualities. Then said Leif, It has not come to pass with us in regard to this land, as with Bjarni, that we have not gone upon it. To this country I will now give a name, and call it Heluland. They returned to the ship, put out to sea, and found a second land. They sailed again to the land, and came to anchor, and launched the boat and went ashore. This was a level wooded land, and there were broad stretches of white sand where they went, and the land was level by the sea. Then said Leif, This land shall have a name after its nature, and we will call it Markland. They returned to the ship forthwith, and sailed away upon the main with northeast winds, and were out two duger before they sighted land. They sailed toward this land, and came to an island which lay to the northward off the land. There they went ashore and looked about them, the weather being fine, and they observed that there was dew upon the grass, and it so happened that they touched the dew with their hands, and touched their hands to their mouths, and it seemed to them that they had never before tasted anything so sweet as this. They went aboard their ship again, and sailed into a certain sound, which lay between the island and a cape, which jutted out from the land on the north, and they stood in, westering past the cape. At ebb tide there were broad reaches of shallow water there, and they ran their ship around there, and it was a long distance from the ship to the ocean. Yet were they so anxious to go ashore, that they could not wait until the tide should rise under their ship, but hasten to the land where a certain river flows out from a lake. As soon as the tide rose beneath their ship, however, they took the boat and rowed to the ship which they conveyed up the river, and so into the lake where they cast anchor and carried their hammocks ashore from the ship, and built themselves booths there. They afterwards determined to establish themselves there for the winter, and they accordingly built a large house. There was no lack of salmon there, either in the river or in the lake, and larger salmon than they had ever seen before. The country thereabout seemed to be possessed of such good qualities that cattle would need no fodder there during the winters. There was no frost there in the winters, and the grass withered but little. The days and nights there were of more nearly equal length than in Greenland or Iceland. On the shortest day of winter, the sun was up between Ektarstad and Dagmalastad. When they had completed their house, Leif said to his companions, I propose now to divide our company into two groups, and to set about an exploration of the country. One half of our party shall remain at home at the house, while the other half shall investigate the land, and they must not go beyond a point from which they can return home the same evening, and are not to separate from each other. Thus they did for a time. Leif himself by turns joined the exploring party, or remained behind at the house. Leif was a large and powerful man, 
and of a most imposing bearing a man of sagacity and a very just man in all things end of part one recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two of the saga of the greenlanders author unknown translated by arthur middleton reeves eighteen fifty six to eighteen ninety one this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two leif the lucky finds men upon a skerry at sea it was discovered one evening that one of their company was missing and this proved to be tyrker the german leif was sorely troubled by this for tyrker had lived with leif and his father for a long time and had been very devoted to leif when he was a child leif severely reprimanded his companions and prepared to go in search of him taking twelve men with him they had proceeded but a short distance from the house when they were met by tyrker whom they received most cordially leif observed at once that his foster father was in lively spirits tyrker had a prominent forehead restless eyes small features was diminutive in stature and rather a sorry-looking individual withal but was nevertheless a most capable handicraftsman leif addressed him and asked wherefore art thou so belated foster father mine and astray from the others in the beginning tyrker spoke for some time in german rolling his eyes and grinning and they could not understand him but after a time he addressed them in the northern tongue i did not go much further than you and yet i have something of novelty to relate i have found vines and grapes is this indeed true foster father said leif of a certainty it is true quoth he for i was born where there is no lack of either grapes or vines they slept the night through and on the morrow leif said to his shipmates we will now divide our labors and each day will either gather grapes or cut vines and fell trees so as to obtain a cargo of these for my ship they acted upon this advice and it is said that their after boat was filled with grapes a cargo sufficient for the ship was cut and when the spring came they made their ship ready and sailed away and from its products leif gave the land a name and called it wineland they sailed out to sea and had fair winds until they sighted greenland and the fells below the glaciers then one of the men spoke up and said why do you steer the ship so much into the wind leif answers i have my mind upon my steering but on other matters as well do ye not see anything out of the common they replied that they saw nothing strange i do not know says leif whether it is a ship or a skerry that i see now they saw it and said that it must be a skerry but he was so much keener of sight than they that he was able to discern men upon the skerry i think it best to tack says leif so that we may draw near to them that we may be able to render them assistance if they should stand in need of it and if they should not be peaceably disposed we shall still have better command of the situation than they they approached the skerry and lowered their sail cast anchor and launched a second small boat which they had brought with them tyrker inquired who was the elder of the party he replied that his name was tory and that he was a norseman but what is thy name leif gave his name art thou a son of eric the red of Brattahild? says he leif responded that he was it is now my wish says leif to take you all into my ship and likewise so much of your possessions as the ship will hold this offer was accepted and with their ship thus laden they held away to eric's firth and sailed until they arrived at Brattahild. having discharged the cargo leif invited tory with his wife gudrid and three others to make their home with him and procured quarters for the other members of the crew both for his own and tory's men leif rescued fifteen persons from the skerry he was afterward called leif the lucky leif had now goodly store both of property and honor there was serious illness that winter in tory's party and tory and a great number of his people died eric the red also died that winter there was now much talk about leif's wineland journey and his brother torvald held that the country had not been sufficiently explored thereupon leif said to torvald 
if it be thy will brother thou mayest go to wineland with my ship but i wish the ship first to fetch the wood which tory had upon the skerry and so it was done torvald goes to wineland now torvald with the advice of his brother leif prepared to make this voyage with thirty men they put their ship in order and sailed out to sea and there is no account of their voyage before their arrival at leif's booths in wineland they laid up their ship there and remained there quietly during the winter supplying themselves with food by fishing in the spring however torvald said that they should put their ship in order and that a few men should take the after boat and proceed along the western coast and explore the region thereabouts during the summer they found it a fair well wooded country it was but a short distance from the woods to the sea and there were white sands as well as great numbers of islands and shallows they found neither dwelling of man nor lair of beast but in one of the westerly islands they found a wooden building for the shelter of grain they found no other trace of human handiwork and they turned back and arrived at leif's booth in the autumn the following summer torvald set out toward the east with the ship and along the northern coast they were met by a high wind off a certain promontory and were driven ashore there and damaged the keel of their ship and were compelled to remain there for a long time and repair the injury to their vessel then said torvald to his companions i propose that we raise the keel upon this cape and call it keelness and so they did then they sailed away to the eastward off the land and into the mouth of the adjoining firth and to a headland which projected into the sea there and which was entirely covered with woods they found an anchorage for their ship and put out the gangway to the land and torvald and all of his companions went ashore it is a fair region here said he and here i should like to make my home they then returned to the ship and discovered on the sands in beyond the headland three mounds they went up to these and saw that they were three skin canoes with three men under each they thereupon divided their party and succeeded in seizing all of the men but one who escaped with his canoe they killed the eight men and then ascended the headland again and looked about them and discovered with the firth certain hillocks which they concluded must be habitations they were then so overpowered with sleep that they could not keep awake and all fell into a heavy slumber from which they were awakened by the sound of a cry uttered above them and the words of the cry were these awake torvald thou and all thy company if thou wouldst save thy life and board thy ship with all thy men and sail with all speed from the land a countless number of skin canoes then advanced toward them from the inner part of the firth whereupon torvald exclaimed we must put out the war boards on both sides of the ship and defend ourselves to the best of our ability but offer little attack this they did and the skrellings after they had shot at them for a time fled precipitately each as best he could torvald then inquired of his men whether any of them had been wounded and they informed him that no one of them had received a wound i have been wounded in my armpit says he an arrow flew in between the gunwale and the shield below my arm here is the shaft and it will bring me to my end i counsel you now to retrace your way with the utmost speed but me ye shall convey to that headland which seemed to me to offer so pleasant a dwelling place thus it may be fulfilled that the truth sprang to my lips when i expressed the wish to abide there for a time you shall bury me there and place a cross at my head and another at my feet and call it crossness for ever after at that time christianity had obtained in greenland eric the red died however before the introduction of christianity torvald died and when they had carried out his injunctions they took their departure and rejoined their companions and they told each other of the experiences which had befallen them they remained there during the winter and gathered grapes and wood with which to freight the ship in the following spring they returned to greenland and arrived with their ship in ericsfirth where they were able to recount great tidings to leif torstein ericsson dies in the western settlement in the meantime it had come to pass in greenland that Thorstein of Ericsfirth had married, and taken to wife Gudrid, 
Torbjorn's daughter, she who had been the spouse of Tori Eastman, as has been already related. Now Torstein Eriksson, being minded to make the voyage to Wineland after the body of his brother, Torvald, equipped the same ship, and selected a crew of twenty-five men of good size and strength, and taking with him his wife Gudrid when all was in readiness, they sailed out into the open ocean, and out of sight of land. They were driven hither and thither over the sea all that summer, and lost all reckoning, and at the end of the first week of winter they made the land at Lisufirth in Greenland in the western settlement. Torstein set out in search of quarters for his crew, and succeeded in procuring homes for all of his shipmates. But he and his wife were unprovided for, and remained together upon the ship for two or more days. At this time Christianity was still in its infancy in Greenland. It befell early one morning that men came to their tent, and the leader inquired who the people were within the tent. Torstein replies, We are twain, says he, but who is it who asks? My name is Torstein, and I am known as Torstein the Swarthy, and my errand hither is to offer you too, husband and wife, a home with me. Torstein replied that he would consult with his wife, and she bidding him decide, he accepted the invitation. I will come after you on the morrow with a sumpter horse, for I am not lacking in means wherewith to provide for you both, although it will be lonely living with me, since there are but two of us, my wife and myself for I, forsooth, am a very hard man to get on with. Moreover, my faith is not the same as yours, albeit methinks that that is the better to which you hold. He returned for them on the morrow with the beast, and they took up their home with Torstein the Swarthy, and were well treated by him. Gudrid was a woman of fine presence, and a clever woman, and very happy in adapting herself to strangers. Early in the winter, Torstein Eriksson's party was visited by sickness, and many of his companions died. He caused coffins to be made for the bodies of the dead, and had them conveyed to the ship and bestowed there, for it is my purpose to have all the bodies taken to Eriksfirth in the summer. It was not long before illness appeared in Torstein's home, and his wife, whose name was Grimhild, was first taken sick. She was a very vigorous woman, and as strong as a man but the sickness mastered her, and soon thereafter Torstein Eriksson was seized with the illness, and they both lay ill at the same time, and Grimhild, Torstein the Swarthy's wife, died, and when she was dead, Torstein went out of the room to procure a deal upon which to lay the corpse. Thereupon Gudrid spoke, Do not be absent long, Torstein mine, says she. He replied that so it should be. Torstein Eriksson then exclaimed, Our housewife is acting now in a marvellous fashion, for she is raising herself up on her elbow and stretching out her feet from the side of the bed and groping after her shoes. At that moment Torstein, the master of the house, entered, and Grimhild laid herself down, wherewithal every timber in the room creaked. Torstein now fashioned a coffin for Grimhild's body and bore it away and cared for it. He was a big man and strong, but it called for all his strength to enable him to remove the corpse from the house. The illness grew upon Torstein Eriksson, and he died, whereat his wife Gudrid was sorely grieved. They were all in the room at the time, and Gudrid was seated upon a chair before the bench, upon which her husband Torstein was lying. Torstein, the master of the house, then taking Gudrid in his arms, carried her from the chair and seated himself with her upon another bench over against her husband's body and exerted himself in diverse ways to console her and endeavoured to reassure her and promised her that he would accompany her to Eriksfirth with the body of her husband Torstein and those of his companions. I will likewise summon other persons hither, says he, to attend upon thee and entertain thee. She thanked him. Then Torstein Eriksson sat up and exclaimed, Where is Gudrid? Thrice he repeated the question, but Gudrid made no response. She then asked Torstein the master, Shall I give answer to his question or not? Torstein the master bade her make no reply, and he then crossed the floor and seated himself upon the chair with Gudrid in his lap and spoke, saying, What dost thou wish, namesake? After a little while, Torstein replies, 
i desire to tell gudrid of the fate which is in store for her to the end that she may be better reconciled to my death for i am indeed come to a goodly resting place this i have to tell thee gudrid that thou art to marry an icelander and that ye are to have a long wedded life together and a numerous and noble progeny illustrious and famous of good odour and sweet virtues ye shall go from greenland to norway and thence to iceland where ye shall build your home there ye shall dwell together for a long time but thou shalt outlive him and shalt then go abroad into the south and shalt return to iceland again to thy home and there a church shall then be raised and thou shalt abide there and take the veil and there thou shalt die when he had thus spoken thorstein sank back again and his body was laid out for burial and borne to the ship thorstein the master faithfully performed all his promises to gudrid he sold his lands and livestock in the spring and accompanied gudrid to the ship with all his possessions he put the ship in order procured a crew and then sailed to ericsfirth the bodies of the dead were now buried at the church and gudrid then went home to leif at bradahild while thorstein the swarthy made a home for himself on ericsfirth and remained there as long as he lived and was looked upon as a very superior man end of part two recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three of the saga of the greenlanders author unknown translated by arthur middleton reeves eighteen fifty six to eighteen ninety one this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three of the wineland voyages of thorfinn and his companions that same summer a ship came from norway to greenland the skipper's name was thorfinn karlsefni he was a son of tord horsehead and a grandson of snorri the son of tord of holdi thorfinn karlsefni who was a very wealthy man passed the winter at bradahild with leif ericsson he very soon set his heart upon gudrid and sought her hand in marriage she referred him to leif for her answer and was subsequently betrothed to him and their marriage was celebrated that same winter a renewed discussion arose concerning a wineland voyage and the folk urged karlsefni to make the venture gudrid joining with the others he determined to undertake the voyage and assembled a company of sixty men and five women and entered into an agreement with his shipmates that they should each share equally in all the spoils of the enterprise they took with them all kinds of cattle as it was their intention to settle the country if they could karlsefni asked leif for the house in wineland and he replied that he would lend it but not give it they sailed out to sea with the ship and arrived safe and sound at leif's booths and carried their hammocks ashore there they were soon provided with an abundant and goodly supply of food for a whale of good size and quality was driven ashore there and they secured it and flensed it and had then no lack of provisions the cattle were turned out upon the land and the males soon became very restless and vicious they had brought a bull with them karlsefni caused trees to be felled and to be hewed into timbers wherewith to load his ship and the wood was placed upon a cliff to dry they gathered somewhat of all of the valuable products of the land grapes and all kinds of game and fish and other good things in the summer succeeding the first winter skrellings were discovered a great troop of men came forth from out of the woods the cattle were hard by and the bull began to bellow and roar with a great noise whereat the skrellings were frightened and ran away with their packs wherein were grey furs sables and all kinds of peltries they fled towards karlsefni's dwelling and sought to effect an entrance into the house but karlsefni caused the doors to be defended against them neither people could understand the other's language the skrellings put down their bundles then and loosed them and offered their wares for barter and were especially anxious to exchange these for weapons but karlsefni forbade his men to sell their weapons and taking counsel with himself he bade the women carry out milk to the skrellings which they no sooner saw than they wanted to buy it and nothing else 
Now the outcome of the Skrellings' trading was that they carried their wares away in their stomachs, while they left their packs and peltries behind with Karlsefni and his companions, and having accomplished this exchange, they went away. Now it is to be told that Karlsefni caused a strong wooden palisade to be constructed and set up around the house. It was at this time that Gudrid, Karlsefni's wife, gave birth to a male child, and the boy was called Snorri. In the early part of the second winter the Skrellings came to them again, and these were now much more numerous than before, and brought with them the same wares as at first. Then said Karlsefni to the women, Do you carry out now the same food which proved so profitable before, and naught else? When they saw this they cast their packs in over the palisade. Gudrid was sitting within in the doorway, beside the cradle of her infant son Snorri, when a shadow fell upon the door and a woman in a black nam kirtle entered she was short in stature and wore a fillet about her head her hair was of a light chestnut colour and she was pale of hue and so big-eyed that never before had eyes so large been seen in a human skull she went up to where gudrid was seated and said what is thy name my name is gudrid but what is thy name my name is gudrid says she the housewife Gudrid motioned her with her hand to a seat beside her. But it so happened that at that very instant Gudrid heard a great crash, whereupon the woman vanished, and at that same moment one of the Skrellings, who had tried to seize their weapons, was killed by one of Karlsefni's followers. At this the Skrellings fled precipitately, leaving their garments and wares behind them, and not a soul save Gudrid alone beheld this woman. Now we must needs take counsel together, says Karlsefni, for that I believe they will visit us a third time in great numbers and attack us. Let us now adopt this plan. Ten of our number shall go out upon the cape and show themselves there, while the remainder of our company shall go into the woods and hew a clearing for our cattle when the troop approaches them from the forest. We will also take our bull and let him go in advance of us. The lay of the land was such that the proposed meeting place had the lake upon the one side and the forest upon the other. Karlsefni's advice was now carried into execution. The Skrellings advanced to the spot which Karlsefni had selected for the encounter, and a battle was fought there in which great numbers of the band of the Skrellings were slain. There was one man among the Skrellings of large size and fine bearing, whom Karlsefni concluded must be their chief. One of the Skrellings picked up an axe, and having looked at it for a time, he brandished it about one of his companions and hewed at him, and on the instant the man fell dead. Thereupon the big man seized the axe, and after examining it for a moment, he hurled it as far as he could out into the sea. Then they fled helter-skelter into the woods, and thus their intercourse came to an end. Karlsefni and his party remained there throughout the winter, but in the spring Karlsefni announced that he was not minded to remain there longer, but would return to Greenland. They now made ready for the voyage, and carried away with them much booty and vines and grapes and peltries. They sailed out upon the high seas, and brought their ships safely to Eriksfirth, where they remained during the winter. Freydis Causes the Brothers to be Put to Death there was now much talk anew about a wineland voyage, for this was reckoned both a profitable and an honorable enterprise. The same summer that Karlsefni arrived from Wineland, a ship from Norway arrived in Greenland. The ship was commanded by two brothers, Helgi and Finbogi, who passed the winter in Greenland. They were descended from an Icelandic family of the East Firths. It is now to be added that Freydis, Eric's daughter, set out from her home at Gardar, and waited upon the brothers Helgi and Finbogi, and invited them to sail with their vessel to Wineland, and to share with her equally all of the good things which they might succeed in obtaining there. To this they agreed, and she departed thence to visit her brother Leif, and ask him to give her the house which he had caused to be erected in Wineland. But he made her the same answer as that which he had given Karlsefni, saying that he would lend the house, but not give it. It was stipulated between Karlsefni and Freydis that each should have on shipboard thirty able-bodied men besides the women. But Freydis immediately violated this compact 
by concealing five men more than this number, and this the brothers did not discover before they arrived in Wineland. They now put out to sea, having agreed beforehand that they would sail in company if possible, and although they were not far apart from each other, the brothers arrived somewhat in advance, and carried their belongings up to Leif's house. Now when Freydis arrived, her ship was discharged, and the baggage carried up to the house, whereupon Freydis exclaimed, Why did you carry your baggage in here? Since we believed, said they, that all promises made to us would be kept. It was to me that Leif loaned the house, says she, and not to you. Whereupon Helgi exclaimed, We brothers cannot hope to rival thee in wrong dealing. They thereupon carried their baggage forth and built a hut above the sea on the bank of the lake and put all in order about it while Freydis caused wood to be felled with which to load her ship. The winter now set in, and the brothers suggested that they should amuse themselves by playing games. This they did for a while, until the folk began to disagree, when dissensions arose between them and the games came to an end, and the visits between the houses ceased, and thus it continued far into the winter. One morning early, Freydis arose from her bed and dressed herself, but did not put on her shoes and stockings. A heavy dew had fallen, and she took her husband's cloak and wrapped it about her, and then walked to the brother's house and up to the door, which had been only partly closed by one of the men who had gone out a short time before. She pushed the door open and stood silently in the doorway for a time. Finbogi, who was lying on the innermost side of the room, was awake and said, What dost thou wish here, Freydis? She answers, I wish thee to rise and go out with me, for I would speak with thee. He did so, and they walked to a tree which lay close by the wall of the house, and seated themselves upon it. How art thou pleased here, says she? He answered, I am well pleased with the fruitfulness of the land, but I am ill content with the breach which has come between us, for methinks there has been no cause for it. It is even as thou sayest, said she, and so it seems to me. But my errand to thee is that I wish to exchange ships with you brothers, for that ye have a larger ship than I, and I wish to depart from here. To this I must accede, said he, if it is thy pleasure. Therewith they parted, and she returned home, in Finbogi to his bed. She climbed up into bed, and awakened Torvard with her cold feet, and he asked her why she was so cold and wet. She answered with great passion, I have been to the brothers, said she, to try to buy their ship, for I wish to have a larger vessel, but they received my overtures so ill that they struck me and handled me very roughly. What time thou, poor wretch, will neither avenge my shame nor thy own, and I find perforce that I am no longer in Greenland. Moreover, I shall part from thee unless thou wreakest vengeance for this. And now he could stand her taunts no longer, and ordered the men to rise at once and take their weapons, and this they did. And they then proceeded directly to the house of the brothers, and entered it while the folk were asleep, and seized and bound them, and led each one out when he was bound. And as they came out, Freydis caused each one to be slain. In this wise all of the men were put to death, and only the women were left, and these no one would kill. At this Freydis exclaimed, Hand me an axe! This was done, and she fell upon the five women and left them dead. They returned home after this dreadful deed, and it was very evident that Freydis was well content with her work. She addressed her companion, saying, If it be ordained for us to come again to Greenland, I shall contrive the death of any man who shall speak of these events. We must give it out that we left them living here when we came away. Early in the spring they equipped a ship which had belonged to the brothers, and freighted it with all of the products of the land which they could obtain, and which the ship would carry. Then they put out to sea, and after a prosperous voyage arrived with their ship in Eriksfirth early in the summer. Karlsefni was there with his ship all ready to sail, and was awaiting a fair wind. And people say that a ship richer laden than that which he commanded never left Greenland. Concerning Freydis Freydis now went to her home, since it had remained unharmed during her absence. She bestowed liberal gifts upon all her companions, for she was anxious to screen her guilt. She now established herself at her home, but her companions were not all so close-mouthed 
concerning their misdeeds and wickedness that rumors did not get abroad at last these finally reached her brother leif and he thought it a most shameful story he thereupon took three of the men who had been of freydis's party and forced them all at the same time to a confession of the affair and their stories entirely agreed i have no heart says leif to punish my sister freydis as she deserves but this i predict of them that there is little prosperity in store for their offspring hence it came to pass that no one from that time forward thought them worthy of aught but evil it now remains to take up the story from the time when karlsefni made his ship ready and sailed out to sea he had a successful voyage and arrived in norway safe and sound he remained there during the winter and sold his wares and both he and his wife were received with great favor by the most distinguished men of norway the following spring he put his ship in order for the voyage to iceland and when all his preparations had been made and his ship was lying at the wharf awaiting favorable winds there came to him a southerner a native of bremen in the saxon land who wished to buy his house neat i do not wish to sell it said he i will give the half of a mork in gold for it says the southerner this karlsefni thought a good offer and accordingly closed the bargain the southerner went his way with the house neat and karlsefni knew not what it was but it was mosur come from wineland karlsefni sailed away and arrived with his ship in the north of iceland in skagafirth his vessel was beached there during the winter and in the spring he bought glaumbeerland and made his home there and dwelt there as long as he lived and was a man of the greatest prominence from him and his wife gudrid a numerous and goodly lineage is descended after karlsefni's death gudrid together with her son snorri who was born in wineland took charge of the farmstead and when snorri was married gudrid went abroad and made a pilgrimage to the south after which she returned again to the home of her son snorri who had caused a church to be built at glambir gudrid then took the veil and became an anchorite and lived there the rest of her days snorri had a son named torgeir who was the father of ingveld the mother of bishop brand halfred was the name of the daughter of snorri karlsefni's son she was the mother of runolf bishop torlok's father bjorn was the name of another son of karlsefni and gudrid he was the father of torun the mother of bishop bjorn many men are descended from karlsefni and he has been blessed with a numerous and famous posterity and of all men karlsefni has given the most exact accounts of all these voyages of which something has now been recounted end of part three recording by expatriate in bangor maine end of the saga of the greenlanders author unknown translated by arthur middleton reeves eighteen fifty six to eighteen ninety one